The haze lifting over the Northeast, but it is thickening over the 2024 presidential race. Donald Trump is set to appear at a Miami court on Tuesday as he faces 37 federal charges for his handling of those classified documents. But before appearing there, the former president appearing in Georgia and North Carolina today. We'll speak with Georgia's Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger on the investigation the former president still faces there. And if you think the former president's primary opponents are slamming him, think again. Most are actually defending him. What does the newcomer in this race, North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum, think? We'll ask him. He's here. First of the Fast and Furious fallout from all of this with Nate Foy in New Jersey on what the former president is facing and saying. Alexis McAdams in North Carolina on his opponents and how they're reacting. And Lucas Tomlinson at the White House with how the current president is responding. Welcome, everybody. Happy to have you. Happy weekend. I'm Neil Cavuto. Let's go to Nate in New Jersey with the latest from the former president there. Hey, Nate. Hey, Neil, you mentioned it. Former President Trump is back on the campaign trail today as he's set to appear in Miami federal court early next week. But we learned yesterday he's facing 37 felony federal charges. And we also learned that he's accused of being personally involved in moving those classified documents from the White House to Mar-a-Lago. Take a look at these pictures that investigators released. They say that uh, these documents contain sensitive military secrets. They were found in a storage room, a ballroom, a bedroom, in bathroom room at Mar-a-Lago. Federal prosecutors say former President Trump showed people who did not have security clearances an attack plan that was prepared for him by the Defense Department and on another occasion a map related to a military operation. The indictment describes an incident, Neil, where Trump is accused of saying, quote, as president, I could have declassified it. Now I can't, you know, but this is still a secret. Special counsel Jack Smith described the severity of these charges. Pause that protect national defense information are critical to the safety and security of the United States, and they must be enforced. Violations of those laws put our country at risk. Neil, former President Trump's aide, Navy veteran Walt Nada, also faces six felony charges for his handling of these documents. He's accused of lying to FBI agents who, of course, raided Mar-a-Lago last August. Now, President Trump is again using an indictment to fundraise for his 2024 campaign. Remember, he saw a big boost in donations after he was indicted on state charges in New York. The former president is again imploring his supporters to donate to fight election interference. Now, back out here live meal as for the former president's schedule today he's set to speak at the gop conventions in georgia and north carolina his first speech today is set for 2 30 in the afternoon we'll send it back to you all right Nate, thank you for that I want to go to alexis mcadams now and what she's hearing on the campaign front on all of this hi alexis hey neil yeah it's been a busy 24 hours here in north carolina there's been a lot of foot track foot traffic rather from a lot of important candidates and we're just hours away now from the former president taking the stage here in North Carolina as Nate mentioned though he'll first stop in Georgia and before that we're going to hear from Mike Pence but Governor DeSantis spoke also Neil yesterday accusing the DOJ of playing politics here take a listen Hillary had the, the emails with the classified and my view was well gee you know as a naval officer if I would have taken classified to my apartment I would have been court-martialed in a New York minute and yet they seem to not care about that. And is there a different standard for a Democrat secretary of state versus a former Republican president? Before Trump does head to North Carolina tonight, the former president speaking at that Georgia GOP convention, Neil, a state where he faces criminal charges, too, related to allegations of election interference back in 2020. That'll be first appearance that he makes publicly since learning that he faces 37 federal charges in Florida since that second indictment hit and faces 34 counts of falsifying business records out in a separate case in New York. His former running mate, Vice President Mike Pence, will also address the crowd of conservatives here in the Tar Heel state in just a about an hour or so. Republicans and Democrats are focusing on North Carolina. They're really trying to win over voters in this battleground state, which is dealing with major population shifts. And the state has a majority of voters that are not affiliated with either political party. You can't win without winning North Carolina. And you think about it, we are 30 percent Republican, 33 percent Democrat, 37 percent unaffiliated. So it is truly going to be that battleground state. And uh, we're, we're excited to have these guys down here because they understand the strategic importance of being here for that Super Tuesday state. 
And Neil, the GOP convention continues here in Greensboro as the former vice president will be on that stage behind me in just a short time. He'll be speaking with voters here at this luncheon and trying to connect with them on a personal level. We'll see how that goes. But in the afternoon, we're going to hear from former President Donald Trump here in Greensboro. And they already uh, sold out tickets, Neil, I guess, a few weeks ago. But people are still trying to get in because they want to hear what the former president's going to say about indictment number two. We'll keep you posted. Back to yeah, you. Yeah, this is his first chance to speak to an audience about that. Uh, thank you for that, Alexis. Now to the White House, Lucas Tomlinson, how the president occupant is dealing with all of this. Lucas. Well, Neil, North Carolina is a pretty crowded place. President Biden was there as well yesterday. He was asked many times about the Trump indictment. He did not want to talk about it. President Biden, have you spoken to Attorney General Merrick Garland yet? I have not spoken to him at all. I'm not going to speak to him. No comment on that. President Biden visiting Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, to tout what he called the economic achievements of his administration. He later went to Fort Liberty, Neal, the recently renamed Fort Bragg, home to the 82nd Airborne Division and the Elite Joint Special Operations Command. His deputy press secretary claims Biden didn't know the indictment was coming. And of course, many people think Hillary Clinton had an issue with classified material and point to those 30,000 or so emails. The Wall Street Journal editorial board sounding a lot like uh, Governor DeSantis there saying, quote, in the court of public opinion, the first question will be about two standards of justice. Mr. Biden had old classified files stored in his Delaware garage next to his sports car. When that news came out, he did not sound too apologetic. Now, as Alexis pointed out, Governor DeSantis there in North Carolina says if he's elected president, he wants to change the name back from Fort Liberty back to Fort Bragg, Neil. All right, Lucas, thank you. Lucas Tomlinson at the White House. Matt, Whit <clears throat> Excuse me. Matt Whitaker joins us right now, the former acting U.S. Attorney General. Matt, it's always good, good to have you, and thank you for coming in on a Saturday, no less. Let me, um, I, I know where you're coming from, and, I, and I've heard a lot of others uh, saying sympathetic to and, and loyal to the former president, even those who might personally not be, saying that this is, is a mischaracterization of justice and unfair. Having said all of that, though, I was reminded, uh, Secretary, by something or attorney, by, by what, Bill Barr had to say, the former attorney general, uh, that Mr. Trump is his own worst enemy, quoting him here. This would have gone nowhere had the president just returned the documents, but he jerked them around for a year and a half. And this is what happens. Do you think at least partially that's true? Well, it's good to be with you this morning, Neil. Uh, you know, I think this case is more complicated uh, than just what that point you try to make. I think this case can never be divorced from the fact that a Democrat president's administration is bringing it against their former opponent and their future opponent, opponent most likely. And so, you know, that context requires, I think, a lot more explaining. And, you know, the point that uh, the reporter made before this is the distinction between Hillary Clinton, Mike Pence, Joe Biden, those all those different cases is not made in this indictment. And and so we're going to have to either hear from Merrick Garland or Jack Smith, or we're gonna to have to hear from someone uh, that has direct knowledge as to why they're going after Donald Trump and not others. And so that two-tier system of justice, Neil, we've talked about it before, is I think the biggest issue here. That plus the interplay, uh, and a lot of legal people have been talking about this, but I think there's an important question on the Presidential Records Act versus the Espionage Act and how those interplay. And I don't think until the Supreme Court ultimately hears this case and those arguments are made that we're gonna know the answer to that. You're quite right, the Presidential Record Act allows a president uh, and a former president access documents and that never came up in this 49 page uh, account. But there are some specifics here, uh, Matthew, that, that <clears throat> make you wonder, uh, yeah. are there some special situations with the former president that just, um, for want of a la uh, lacking a legal term, look icky? Uh, the icky part would be the former president saying, allegedly, in these documents, among other things, wouldn't it be better if we just told them, referring to the National Archives trying to get these documents back, that we don't have anything here? Uh, and that uh, when his lawyers told him in May 2022 that they had to comply with a grand jury subpoena seeking the return of these documents, he wouldn't answer. In the same conversation, he apparently praised the lawyer for Hillary Clinton for what he claimed was the act of deleting those 30,000 emails when she was in government. Uh, he did a great job, the former president allegedly said. That, yeah. that, that's discomforting, is it not? 
Yeah, and Neil, I've signed um, personally hundreds of indictments when I was a U.S. attorney, and I know, you know, sort of there are ways to write indictments, and, and like you said, I mean, this is made to look as bad as possible. They brought specific examples of evidence, in order, it's a speaking indictment that tries to pile on uh, the, with a lot of counts to make it look uh, dramatic, let's just say that. And I'm just, my point is, is this is the high water mark for the government. Uh, as no, no, we move you're absolutely forward, right. You know, I understand that, but are some of the comments themselves dramatic on a 180 from what the former president was saying when he was running for the Oval Office in 2016? At the time, uh, he was talking about the importance of protecting classified information. Uh, recounting at that no. time that he had said one of the first things we must do is enforce all classification rules and to enforce all laws relating to the handling of classified information. I think it's pretty clear uh, that that didn't happen here. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I'm going to say the quiet part out loud. We must protect our national secrets. However, presidents and former presidents especially are just different than, an, uh, you know, a, a, an E3 at the U.S. Navy and you know what the president of the United States did uh, you know certainly they, they need they should have been more careful when moving out of the White House but there is certainly a period of time to your Bill Barr quote Neil that there needs to be an accommodation there needs to be a way to sort through the voluminous records of a president uh, obviously the uh, the National Archives together with the FBI reached a point where they got frustrated and they decided to elevate this to criminal charges and and you know the question is was was it was it a one year what, what what's what's the standard well right. you know how long does joe biden when he leave how long does he have to make sure well, that no, he no, doesn't you raise a lot of very good points about the, and, and it's possible i'm trying to give the benefit of the doubt here you're a great lawyer I, you know i watch a lot of legal shows that's my knowledge you're too kind neil but but the one thing i don't understand is whether the former president understood the gravity of this and the seriousness of deflecting or or delaying getting documents back to the government or whether he knew that could be a criminal offense. Do you think he did? Right. Well, I don't want to get inside the mind of Donald Trump, but I will tell you that I think if you look at the, what happened in this period of time, he thought he was under the, the uh, Presidential Records Act and yeah. probably was being told that by his you know, lawyers. And all of a sudden the FBI determined that he was under the Espionage Act. Uh, even if he's a former president. I, I, I th again, that is not explained in this indictment. The federal government has not explained it. And I still just point to that I'm very concerned when the pre you know when former presidents and former leaders and current leaders of political parties are targeted by administrations. It's just it's the natural way. And I'm not saying that anybody is above the law, but we have to have equal justice under the law. And I fear for what this portends for the future of our country. And it's going to take a lot of statesmen and stateswomen to put this uh, you know, back together. We shall see. Matthew Whitaker, very good having you on. Uh, the former acting uh, U.S. Attorney General. Thank you, Thank you Matt. Uh, in the meantime, there are some basic requirements to become President of the United States. Actually, three fit the bill. you got to be at least 35 years old. Uh, you have to be born in this country. You have to have lived the last 14 years of your life in this country. Uh, so on those standards, uh, Donald Trump is ready to go. Even if he's indicted, even if he's convicted, after this. All right, the president is going uh, to be, the former president, Donald Trump, is going to be in Georgia, North Carolina today. There'll be the first opportunity for large audiences, in fact, uh, sold-out audiences, uh, to hear what he has to say about his indictments that went down, the first such federal uh, charges that have been made against a former president in U.S. history. But the president has popped up on his uh, social site, Truth Social, saying, America went to sleep last night with tears in its eyes. Someday soon, however, it will be able to wipe away those tears and smile bigger than ever before. For we will have defeated the radical left Marxists, fascists, communists, lunatics, and deranged maniacs and cleared the path to put America first and then quickly make America great again. All right, uh, I wonder what Doug Burgum thinks of that. He's the latest entrant in the presidential race, the governor of North Dakota. Governor, good to have you back. 
Great to be with you, Neil. I, I know you and others have spoken to the point that this is a, and I don't want to misquote you, sir, the, a weaponization of government to go after an individual, in this case, Donald Trump. But there is a lot of smoke there. There is a lot of things he did there that maybe he did not know were potentially criminal, but they raise questions about why so many documents, why so reluctant to turn them over, why store them the way you did, apparently lie about what you were doing to give them back. Um, a lot of questionable behavior there. What do you think? Well, the, the eyes of the world are on the United States, and when we're, you know, potentially weaponizing the Department of Justice to go after a former president, not just a former president, but a former president who's running for <clears throat> to become president again, and that Justice Department is being driven by the leading candidate of the opposite party. I mean, th this is the kind of stuff that you never thought would happen in America. And so I think it's a dangerous precedent. And it's, of course, I'm sure it's what the Democrats want is to have the whole nation but is it uh, talking about these charges. Uh, is it only political? The reason why I was asked is that the president was not charged with mishandling any of the classified documents that he returned to the National Archives and the Records Administration. Uh, he was only charged when he refused to turn over what authorities had sought. So it makes you think, had he just done what he was supposed to do and turned over the documents, none of this, none of this weaponization or whatever would be going on. Well, we don't know that. That's a, you're speculating, Neil. But what we do know uh, well, I know is what that came out in the indictment, right? It had nothing to do with documents that were handed over. It had everything to do with documents that never were. Yeah, well, I can just tell you when we're on the road in Iowa the last two days and here in New Hampshire talking about the economy, talking about energy policy, talking about national security, those are the things that are hitting every American every single day. Uh, and to the extent that, that the Democrats want everybody in the nation to be talking about the past as opposed to the future, you know, that's good for them because then we're not talking about Biden's disastrous uh, record on the economy, on energy or national security. You're, you're no doubt right on a lot of that that you're getting into, but you're also down, what, 40, 50 points behind the president right now. And, and you've got a lot of ground to make up. You have nothing to lose just to, uh, going to question a lot of the things that were raised here and to separate yourself from what's going on there when you glom on to a, a view that this is all a weaponization it might indeed be the case you really can't distinguish yourself and yet you do have a great record you're a billionaire you're a rags to riches story uh you've been a very productive governor in north dakota uh, but, but on this, you seem to be more vanilla in line with a standard party response. And I just wonder, a guy with your skill set and business background, you could pick apart this and see the weaponization part, but the other part too, and raise it on the stump. Well, Neil, I, I thank you for those kind words. But again, I think we're... Uh, this is this is this this interview is an example of what what the Democrats love, which is all we're talking about is the past. When you talk to actual voters on the ground in Iowa, the last two but days, you're running like we're for the Republican the nomination, two days. Governor. Other Republicans are going to talk about it too, and they want to see where where you are in the field. Whether you agree with someone like a Chris Christie, who seems to say that there's something of substance here, uh, right. that this is you know of, of the former president's own doing, or Asa Hutchison, the Arkansas governor, the former governor who's running for the same job you want, saying that this means that Donald Trump should step out of the race. I'm not saying you have to echo what they're saying but they're talking about it your thoughts well well sure they are neil and 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 again the, when, when i was a ceo and when we were doing a startup and we were trying to create differentiation about when the first trade show i went to when we had this little tiny startup there were 64 other companies there doing the same thing we didn't come out of the box and say here's what we nobody knows who we are nobody knows our product let's talk about what the other 64 companies are doing wrong. You talk about what you can bring to the party, what you've got to value, and the things that we're talking about to the voters in the Republican primary are about the things that they're worried about. They're worried about inflation. They're worried about the price of gas. They're worried about the border. And that's what we're going to keep talking about. But they're worried about, about this about, too, Governor. 54% of Americans think that this stuff is true. on, And this, these criminal issues are criminal enough and concerning enough that they, they're worried about it. Why can't you, as a guy running for president, distinguish yourself and say, all right, if you had a situation like this, would you do what the former president did? 
Well, when I'm president, there's going to be an equal application of the law because I think okay. the concern that the voters have about this is that there's a double standard. Is there going to be one principle that's applied to Republicans and another principle that's applied to Democrats? And I think that's a very legitimate concern uh, that people have. But th right. this is a... Uh, in America, you're, you're innocent until proven guilty. And so right now, in terms of our campaign, uh, we need to focus on the things that are, matter the most to the most number of Americans, the economy, energy, and national security. All right. And clearly, for the time being, not this. All right, Governor, I want to thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Neil. All right. Stay with us. Hi, Neil. Well, I had no doubt that we were going to have clear skies for this race. Uh, you know, lucky, though, because Wednesday we had the worst air quality in New York City. But the winds have shifted. Instead of coming from the north, where we have all those fires still currently burning across uh, Canada, now we have a southerly flow. And it is really a spectacular day for the 155th annual Belmont Stakes taking place on Fox for the very first time. Post time is 7.02. And yesterday, I got to speak to a legend, a legend horse caller. He's been doing it for over 40 years. He retired almost 10 years ago. But Tom Durkin is back in the announcer booth to call this race. And I got to speak with him. Take a look. This booth has been here since 1964. Wow, and I you've called races from here. Oh, five, this was home. Tell us, so will you be looking at the monitor or do you look out no, the window? No, look at the horses. I look, look at, the horses at the horses through 15 power binoculars. We have to talk about the color pens. This is fascinating. Yeah. So what do you do with this? Well, I, 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 I color in uh, on the program. Here's what the, the program is gonna look like. There are the like. horses. And, uh, and, you know, Tappet Shoes is gonna be yellow with a uh, pink hat and Tappet Trice is going to be pink with yellow sleeves. Okay. And then, so I'm looking at this and there really aren't too many that look alike. I am so excited to see Tom call this race. And Neil, you know, he is one of those people that's very forthcoming. You know, he got out of the business because he had tremendous anxiety about calling races. And when Fox Sports came to him and said, Tom, we'd love for you to come back out of retirement to call this 155th Belmont Stakes, he said yes. And he does all sorts of breathing exercises, a lot of Zen moments. He taught me how to breathe. So to see Tom Durkin back after retirement uh, is really exciting. And of course, this is the first time Fox is going to be broadcasting this epic race. We don't have a triple crown winner, but this is the 50th anniversary of the best of all time secretariat. Uh, so we're going to be certainly celebrating that incredible race here at Belmont. Phenomenal. Uh, thank you very much for that, Janice. You're such a natural at this. Uh, Janice Dean, following all <laughs> of that. Uh, Dr. Marty McCary is with us right now uh, because I said the smoke is cleared, but you know, there are lingering concerns. A lot of people still have them. And, and by the way, it, it, it is cleared in much of the Northeast, hasn't cleared everywhere. Uh, doctor, good to have you. What do you do or what do you recommend to people now? They think it looks clear outside every, in most places. It's fine now, but it, it hasn't completely gone. So what do you tell folks? Well, good morning, Neil. You know, uh, one of the greatest hazards of this smoke has been motor vehicle accidents. And when people think of the danger of the smoke, most of it's related to the visibility. The, the sort of medical harm from the smoke is related to the duration of the direct exposure. And there are some people with asthma and respiratory disease that are still having a little shortness of breath or some irritation of the respiratory tract. You know, if you're on an asthma medication, take an extra puff. Uh, every now and then somebody comes to the emergency room with a little shortness of breath and they get a steroid treatment or a nebulizer. But by and large, this is a transient phenomena and the medical harm is proportional directly to the duration of exposure. It's not like you're gonna catch a virus being out and exposed to it for five minutes and then you test positive. This is something clearly related to the duration. So I think we tend to see medical harms now in extremes, particularly after the politicalization of COVID where it's all or nothing, it's always wear a mask, never wear a mask. But the reality is that this is something that is clearly relational to the duration of exposure. And that duration has been short for the vast majority of Americans. All right. Meanwhile, in Canada, especially in the eastern part of the country and where a lot of this started in Nova Scotia, what have you, that's an ongoing situation. For, so for those residents, you say? 
Yeah, so there's a good example where you've got some prolonged exposure. And, you know, during the COVID pandemic, we told people there's clearly a distribution of risk, right? The young, healthy people are at a very different risk profile. Go check on those who are at risk. Go check on those who are older, senior, vulnerable, have asthma, and make sure they're okay. See if they need food. Go buy food for them. If you are young and healthy, you've got a physiologic reserve that means you're resilient to this wildfire smoke, and you want to check on those who are particularly vulnerable, especially in those areas where now in Canada there's a prolonged exposure. Wise words all. Doctor, great catching up with you again. Be well. Thanks, Neil. All right, Dr. Martin McCarry. Meanwhile, have you seen the latest to turn at the border? This just could be the secret weapon after this. I had gone down there expecting to see, you know, the, the kind of prototypical Central American refugee from Guatemala, El Salvador, Nicaragua. But that's not what's happening. These are people who have, because of the open border policies, they have, uh, they're now being, uh, they're being called and summoned from all over the world. There's advertisements in these countries that it's easy to get in the United States. Donald Trump, who leads for the Republican nomination, now he was an advocate of building a wall, shutting down the border. Uh, you know, he had mixed success there, but the Republicans argue much better success than we're seeing now. How would you differentiate yourself from that approach? <laughs> Oh, well, you know, I, I actually think some of the things that Trump did as much as I opposed them at that time, and I still oppose a wall all the way. I don't think we need a, a 2,200 mile wall and the Border Patrol people that I talk to don't believe that either. But you do need surveillance on that, you know, that it, most of the border. You need, and we need a physical barrier during, in the places where so there's he was a lot right of population. About, he was right about that. You're more in agreement with his approach than you are with President Biden's approach, it would seem. Uh, I, I am on, that, this, on this particular issue. You know, uh, you know, we've talked about the border and the concern that's largely along party lines about what's happening there. Democrats, not so much. Republicans, very much. But there's a crack there when an RFK Jr. comes out and tells me, as he did, and visits the border, that we've got a serious problem there. And uh, it, it will get the better of us if we don't do something soon and fast. No comment from the White House on what uh, the challenger to the president has said on all of this. Want to go to Chris Olivares, the Texas uh, Department of Public Safety's top guy looking at public safety and trying to deal with this issue head on. You know, Chris, I was thinking a lot about what uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. was saying. Um, and it echoes a lot of what you've been, been saying. What's remarkable isn't so much you saying because you've been very consistent on it. It's another thing what a prominent Democratic presidential candidate says it. Do you think that is a turning event? I believe so, Neil. That's a, that was a great interview, by the way. Um, just the fact that, you know, Robert Kennedy Jr. actually went to the border, uh, was actually at the border, you know, at 2 a.m., where you see all the activity, especially there in Arizona. I got to see people crossing the border. That's what's needed on both sides. Of course, that's why this shouldn't be a political issue, because this issue affects the entire country. And just seeing that, you know, in itself, I mean, really shows that it is a turning point. And I think that's what's needed. Um, of course, you know, we've been doing it, you know, for the past two years. You know, Governor Abbott has been doing it for over two years now and even moving forward. But now to see somebody from the other party actually do that and actually go to the border and talk to border officials and have an understanding and actually agree with the previous leadership, what was working uh, really goes to show you that everything that we've been saying has been consistent and really goes to show what works to, in order to stop this border situation and really uh, put something in place to secure the border. Well, what's interesting, and maybe you could tell me a little bit about it, Chris, is this uh, new thing that the governor set up in the Rio Grande River. It almost looks like a pool divider you'd see in a lot of, you know, safe s swimming zones in, in various communities. But tell me what's going on here, what this is all about. Well, this is just another added uh, layer of defense, Neil. I mean, we saw what we did uh, in Brownsville, Texas, during the week of Title 42, where we were able to use our state troopers, National Guard, and place razor wire along the river and actually stop uh, thousands of potential crossings in that particular area and actually redirect some of those immigrants back to Mexico to the ports of entry. Now, we carried that strategy to Eagle Pass, Texas, which is seen in some of those photos of where this, this actual barrier is going to be placed. This is a water barrier. Um, it's going to contain four-foot buoys that will be placed in the middle of the river. And the river is already dangerous in that area. Of course, we've seen many 
drownings over the years, especially with some of the correspondents that have been down there reporting on it. But now this is going to prevent any potential legal crossings between the ports of entry and most importantly, prevent drownings and those human smugglers that are bringing people across on rafts where it's going to be nearly impossible now to cross that river. So, again, another unprecedented move, another unprecedented action by Governor Abbott actually putting more resources in place to stem that flow of mass migration. And again, this is a strategy that we're going to carry on throughout the Texas border, but really goes to show how Texas has stepped up uh, in the absence of the federal government, where really this is something they could have done, you know, in the, especially in the past two years, but they refused to do it. So we'll find ways to enhance our operations. And that's a clear example of what we're doing and how we're able to actually step up and, and, and take over what we what the federal government should be doing now to secure the border. Um, can you swim under it, Chris? It'll be very difficult, Neil. I can tell you it's nearly impossible to get around that barrier. I mean, mm-hmm. you would have to be, a, you know, a very, very skilled swimmer. And right. even then, that makes it more...